Hello, my name is Wim van Petegem. Uh, I work at the University of Leuven. Uh, I used to be the Vice President Research uh, of Eden. Uh, and I'm happy today here to talk with uh, Anthony Camilleri, uh, who is uh, talking about blockchain uh, technology. Anthony, maybe uh, you can first introduce yourself. Uh. So hi Wim, thanks for the invite, first of all. Um, uh, essentially, uh, my background is as a uh, consultant in educational innovation and research. And for the past year and a half, I have actually been investigating the potentials of this new technology uh, called blockchain and uh, looking at the different ways it might affect education and then also using that information to advise governments around Europe in what approach they should take towards these new emerging areas. Okay. Sounds interesting for uh, the next coming questions, but maybe to start off where uh, we can, um, how, how do you define blockchain technology yourself? Um, okay, um, simply enough, a blockchain is a special kind of database that is decentralized, unhackable and undestroyable. Um, more importantly though, blockchain is a way for people to transact between each other online without the need for any intermediary or central party. Okay, I, I think many people know blockchain technology as a technology which is behind uh, cryptocurrencies uh, like Bitcoin and so, uh, but uh, we are here today to talk about uh, education and higher education in particular. Um, how do you see blockchain, blockchain technology uh, related to the work that we are doing in higher education? Is that a new learning technology or is it, how, how do you yeah, define that in this context? So um, it is not per se a technology for teaching and learning. Mm -hmm. Blockchain is a technology for storing and for transacting value. Mm -hmm. However, if we look at the education area, what is education if not about transferring value in the form of knowledge? Mm -hmm. And in education, we have a lot of different ways of representing that knowledge. Probably the easiest way is the credential, the certificate you get at the end of a course, which isn't really just a piece of paper. It is a representation of all the educational value you have gotten. A completely different example might be journal papers. Your citation count as a researcher is actually a measure of the scientific value you have created. We have other measures of value such as patents, such as copyrights, and we could continue. So when you start thinking of blockchain like this as a way that helps you transact and store this value in a better way than today, then you start seeing how it could be very interesting and how it connects to some of the fundamentals of education. Okay, can we uh, go a bit deeper on, on, on yeah, the value in, 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 in credentials? Um, how do you envision that? Uh, uh, is that already happening in universities? Um, and and how, do, how it, does it go? Uh, Okay, so at the moment, this of course has happened for centuries at universities. You mean the but certificates? There's yeah. the yeah. credentials, but a credential today is effectively a piece of paper that says you know this amount of information. You take that credential to an employer, they look at the piece of paper, and effectively they will often essentially call back the institution and ask them, is this real, and what does this represent, and what does it mean? Sufficient to say this is not an ideal situation. So where blockchain comes in is that blockchain, by allowing you to create a database that is uneditable and unhackable, and it's mathematically provable to be so, you can then actually take that credential to an employer and it becomes automatically recognizable, automatically verifiable, which, very, which significantly increases the speed of the transactions. Also, because a blockchain is a, a distributed database that is stored by many parties instead of by one central party, even if the institution that awarded it is completely destroyed by an earthquake or another natural disaster, the proof of your certificate will still exist. You can still prove the knowledge you know and that certificate will continue to uh, So exist. you will never lose your certificate anymore. Exactly. Right? You will yeah. never lose your certificate and you will never need the intervention of the person who issued it to actually prove it. 
And uh, you're now talking about, let's say, well-established institutions that are also in that blockchain uh, technology. But what if, if, if students have like uh, non-formal learning certificates uh, or, or maybe other certificates uh, that are not issued by, by higher education institutes? Uh, is, is that also a possibility mm -hmm. that, that we could um, imagine or, or is that far away? Uh, so that isn't a possibility you uh, need to imagine. That is something that already exists. So, uh, before I continue, I have to say that sure. I don't represent or promote any of these companies. Yeah. But for example, you could go to accredible.com right now, sign up for an account and issue a blockchain verified credential for any purpose, from participation, uh, from participation in a seminar to participation in a course through to a full degree. And it basically, all it requires you to do is sign up and actually start issuing those credentials. Uh oh. I, I'm not sure if I understand it right. Does that mean that I'm uh, working at the University of Leuven? I can go to that website and I can get my certificate from the University of Leuven? Um, uh, no, it means that if I, Anthony, decide to offer a course in blockchain studies okay. and I want to issue verified certificates oh, to my students, yeah, I can yeah, go okay. and issue them. Yeah, yeah okay, I, I, I got it wrong, so thank you. Um, you were also talking about uh, values in, in, in your research papers, uh, journal papers and so. How does that go? Um, okay, um, first of all, I should state my, we are, let's say, political alliances mm -hmm. here. And simply enough, I'm one of the people who believes in open access to scientific okay. publications. Okay. And I believe especially that uh, research paid for with public money should be open and free. At the moment, we have a different system. We have a system that is controlled by three to four major publishers. Now, the thing is, the internet already made publishers, the need for publishers, to evaporate two decades ago. I mean, I can press one button and it's published to the world. So why do we still use publishers? And the reason we still use publishers is because they still control the ledger, the database of who published what where and who cited who where. And those citations are extremely valuable because they're what essentially determine your career as an academic. I mentioned before that blockchain is technology that gets rid of the intermediaries. So imagine if you could run this database, just the same as it's run today, with the same set of rules, but, except without, that you, but without any company controlling it. It would be run by the libraries of Europe or the research centers of Europe together. And that's what blockchain makes possible in this area. Okay, so it's open publications without publishers. Yes, uh, open publications, open citations without the need for publishers run by okay. the research foundations themselves. Okay, great. Um, this morning in your keynote speech you were also mentioning uh, one of the possibilities in, uh, with blockchain technology is smart contracts. Uh, I was quite interested in, 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 in that uh, application, let's say. Um, can you elaborate a little bit on, on smart contracts in the context of higher education institutions? Uh, okay, um, first I need to explain what a smart yeah. contract is. Okay. So, with a regular contract, uh, me and you will agree on a, certain, uh, on a certain set of things, and after the contract is signed, each of us as parties need to execute those conditions. Essentially, we have to do what we say. Mm -hmm. A smart contract is... Just to interrupt you, mm -hmm. does that mean that, for instance, a learning contract between an institution and a student might be one of these Yes, contracts? that could be. So, for example, a very simple one in a, Eras a typical Erasmus agreement, okay. I will say that uh, I can say that if you study these five ECTS at another institution, when you come back, as long as you pass, I will recognize them as part of your degree. Um, the thing is, I've said I will do that, but it doesn't necessarily mean I will do that. Yeah. The fact that I've signed the contract doesn't make it true. All it means is I've committed to make it true. Okay. A smart contract is slightly different. A smart contract is a contract written as code and put on a blockchain. And remember that once it's put on the blockchain, it cannot be deleted and effectively it cannot be changed. So once I've made that commitment, the contract will run on the blockchain as if it's running on a computer and it becomes self-executing, which means as soon as the conditions which are coded into the contract occur, the contract will execute. In our example, the second I get the right set of grades from the institution I am visiting, um, 
the contract would be monitoring the grade system of that university, it will automatically add them to my prospectus at the first one. And once we've written it as a smart contract, it will just happen. No person needs to intervene to execute it. But it also works the other way around, I think. A contract always has two parties. Uh, what you're describing now is, uh, let's say, what happens at the institutional side. But if you're a learner and you have a learning contract with the university, then it also means that you have responsibilities as a learner to, to uh, execute the contract. Absolutely. So it all depends on the conditions. So I can tell you where these are being used typically at the okay. moment. Mm -hmm. And the thing is, not surprisingly, uh, the area that's generating the most excitement is actually payment of incentives via smart contracts. Okay. So I can award you a scholarship as a student, as a funder, and the contract signed by the funder and the student, and the money is already committed by the funder the second the contract is signed. But it will only be released to the student if and when the student hits certain grades. Now, because the contract is signed, that money is Already the students, provided they hit yeah. the grade, the funder can't change their mind later. But if the student doesn't hit the grade, he can't come with like a hundred stories, why, reasons why not. The money will be automatically returned to the funder. You could imagine performance incentives for teachers, even say based on citation counts, student evaluations, that happen the same way. So basically, instead of, let's say, moving all of these up to committees with not just the inefficiencies of committees, but the inefficiencies, the, let's say, difference in decisions, the lack of harmonization, in some areas the corruption that can happen in these. You just code the rules into the contract and all of this automatically happens. This all sounds very, uh, let's say, fantastic to me, uh, but, but uh, is, is it already happening in, in, in universities or higher education institutes uh, here in Europe or elsewhere in the world? Uh, okay, you know so um, I always talk about what is possible in blockchain and at some level a lot of this is already happening, okay. but it's happening at extremely simple, extremely, uh, uh, let's say, extremely starting areas. Mm -hmm. Blockchain effectively is still an unproven technology, and one thing I would warn anyone watching this is that there are literally thousands of startups mm -hmm. that are in the process of raising money to build blockchain applications, and it's pretty much standard on the pitch deck to say that you will do absolutely everything with blockchain and you will change the world with blockchain. While that might be possible many years from now, a lot of the applications are simpler. So one uh, some of the simple applications that already exist, that are already funded in terms of smart contracts are in fact these types of ones where funders give an amount and it's released to students based under certain conditions. Um, another simple one I've seen an example of is uh, funding given to a student based on attendance. So if you log in 10 times to the learning management system and like to each of the modules, your funding will be released. So it's an extremely simple implementation of it, but because of the way it's implemented, it's a harbinger of things to come. But that's still a few million lines of code away. Okay, yeah. I, I think there is still, well, being myself involved in higher education, uh, I can imagine all these applications, mm -hmm. like you say, uh, but, but I still think that, uh, well, probably we have a long way to go before we're there yet. Uh, we have a very, very long way to go, and the most important thing I would say over here is that because blockchain is such a young technology, it's pretty much impossible to say what the use case will be. And if we do this interview again in three years, I'm really sure it'll be a completely different set of use cases. The first researchers that, let's say, were sending emails of the internet did not in a million years imagine that the main use of it today would be Facebook and Netflix. Um, so what we can say at the moment is that blockchain changes some of the fundamental value propositions of the internet as we know it. That right. means it will change things, but where it will take us specifically at the moment, these are just scenarios. Yeah. Okay, um, I, I think we have to, 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 to summarize this uh, here, uh, but uh, is, is there any particular message you would like to bring to the Eden community? Uh, if it's within, well, you mentioned within three years, mm -hmm. we will probably have another uh, interview. Mm -hmm. um, is, is there anything that you would give us as a, as a society and, and uh, as an association, I mean, uh, as a message? Uh, um, I would actually make a two-part message. Now, okay. first of all, blockchain has been overhyped beyond any reasonable level and actually it is an area where there are 
not hundreds but thousands of bad actors working and unfortunately that at the moment especially gives the entire technology a little bit of a bad smell. Um, that said, the reason everybody is jumping on this bandwagon is because they've seen a new gold rush. There is something quite valuable there and for every real serious actor, there are 10 charlatans trying to jump on that bandwagon. But the other thing I would argue to Eden is that it is the role of education to actually lead this charge. Most people I speak to in education, and most people I've spoken to at this conference, are interested in finding 20 reasons why it might not work, or why it might not re revolutionize education, or taking a wait and see attitude. And at least the way I was taught to think of the scientific method is ask questions, doubt everything by all means, but then go ahead and build experiments to prove it one way or another. And especially in a technology that gives value to knowledge, which isn't that what we're all supposed to be about, I would just argue effectively, experiment as much as you can, move fast and break things. So be a bit less reluctant uh, mm -hmm. and adopt the new technologies uh, and also blockchain mm -hmm. and maybe then come back yeah. in three years from now and yeah. see where we are well, at that moment. Not yeah. adopt, test, experiment, see what can be done. Then we can decide on adoption later. But it's an exciting, okay. exciting new technology. Let's figure out what it can do to actually really help learners. Okay, thank you. That's an important message for us. Uh, and thank you for being here with this interview. My pleasure. Okay.